writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host and the show's producer, David Allen Lucas. And this is part two of the Right Pack. In today's episode, we're going to talk to steampunk author Brad R. Cook. We're going to talk to the beautiful and scientifically minded Melanie Colaney. And we are going to talk to the man who insists that he is only an amateur writer, Matt McGraw, expert at sarcasm. And also the man who gave us the term we are now using both on the show and outside of it, the applesauce salesman. Of course, that's the polite version of the tr- of that term. If you've missed that in a previous episode, applesauce salesmen refers to those people who wear suits and ties and have to have everything just like look like last time and easy to sell and so forth. I won't ruin the actual exposure of s of that um, word. So, and I don't remember which episode it first appeared on. So. Guess you're going to start with season, start with episode one, and catch up if you haven't caught it already. These last three episodes are all about who we are, who the right pack is, and in the last episode, um, we talked about the origins of the right pack. Uh, before I turn over the mic to all the interviews that are going to happen, I'm just going to share a very quick story about the right pack and one of our write-ins. I mentioned last time that we talked, that we wrote in coffee shops and other places. One of the other places was actually a neighborhood bar. We wrote there until it closed down um, suddenly. And one of the things that happened, if you would imagine in your mind a round wooden table in which all of the members of the right pack, or a huge number of us anyway, were sitting around with our laptops, and our headphones on, plugged into our laptops. And we're sitting there, we're typing away. Yes, we would pause and have conversations or whatever, but pretty much we were quiet. Everybody that night was in the zone. And up walked a very flirtatious, very drunk man, and came up, started to hit on a couple of of the females of the group, and what, it started going, why aren't you guys all talking? What's going on? Blah, 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 blah. We took care of him easily enough by re-diverting him away from us. But, you know, the myth out, myth out there, and the point of the story is, the myth is always, writers like bars to go and write and get rid of our demons or whatever, however that myth goes. Well, the experience of the right pack is the bar is not exactly the best location to write. It can be quite a distraction. Though, honestly, you do run into some very interesting characters. And you never know if they will show up in one of our stories. And with that, let me turn the mic now over to the interview with Brad R. Cook. Hello, this is Kathleen Kayenberg. And David Allen Lucas. And we are here with Brad R. Cook to introduce you all to members of the Right Pack Radio. Hi, Brad. Hello. So, who is Brad R. Cook, the uh, author? Don't ask that. <laughs> now, uh, well, I guess uh, the easiest way to put that is that he is an author of steampunk novels. Uh, the more complex way, I guess, of saying that would be that he started off as a playwright and... Uh, now is an author of kick-ass historical fantasy. Why the R? Because uh, it differentiates me from another Brad Cook, who is also a writer, who has written some novels. 
So, and then there's also um, locally there are there's a doctor and a lawyer and uh, somebody else who are all Brad Cooks. So, Brad Cook was horribly taken, and Brad R. Cook is not, and I rule Brad R. Cook. All right, so <laughs> now you know if you're ever looking for Brad R. Cook's work, you definitely yes. want to keep the R in keep there. Keep the R in there. I'm not that other guy. So, what sort of work have you done? What sort of genres do you like to write in? Uh, well. Uh, I guess most of the biggest one would be his, what I would love to lovingly refer to as historical fantasy. Uh, and I'd mean that to differentiate it from high fantasy or one of the others. Um, you know, I enjoy the historical nature of like historical fiction and historical nonfiction, historical creative nonfiction. Um, you know, fun things like that, but I do love getting to do whatever I want. So that the fantasy part means that I get to do whatever I want. With history. <laughs> so does that take a lot of research then, I'm guessing? Yes and no. Actually, it's a, it's a lifelong thing. So, um, you know, I took every history course my high school offered. Took most of them that my college offered. So, you know, there's that, that sense of like, I, I, you know, I already have this vast knowledge of history. And then I love watching the History Channel and things like that. So mostly my, you know, the... Research for each book is specific, but history in general, oh no, that's just a love. What 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 is it about history that you love? Because they're better storytellers than we could ever be. Uh, I find that whenever I look back into history, I'm reading stories that I would love to have created, and if I did, no one would believe me. But because they actually happened in real life back someday, uh, we get to kind of look at that and smile and go, hmm great story what is what is an example what are some of the the places that you've read about history too and uh, authors that have just made it come alive for you well okay times in history would be something specific we'll get to that in a second so specific right. writers though and authors yes um i love historical stories so anything over 100 years old um i'm a huge fan of um i have read a lot of older and ancient authors um I have read the book Five Rings. We've talked about that before. Uh, written by a samurai. You know, I've written, uh, I've read, uh, you know, gosh, uh, I love La Morte Arthur, which was written in 1400s by... Uh, Sir Thomas Mallory. Yeah, Sir mm -hmm. Thomas Mallory. So, you know, there's... I, I, I love that sense of conveying history, taking history and pushing it forward. Um, you know, we get to know about history. You know, if you look at the Iliad, you look at Beowulf, you look at any of these things. These are real stories from history that have been passed down to us. I love that. Um, people like Bram Stoker, even, who, you know, sat in his, you know, hotel room, basically, his room, and uh, wrote this amazing story out that's just crazy, you know. It was contemporary for his time, but mm -hmm. now here we are 100 years later, plus, and still reading it. I love that. Um, in terms of actual history, I love the amazing stories, some of which were totally getting thrown around. I have always loved the 300 Spartans who fought off the Persians at the hot gates in Greece, you know, um, you know, the past Thermopylae. I've loved that story my whole life. I love they turned it into a movie series and everything. You know, that is an amazing epic tale that's been passed down through the centuries to us. Uh, you know, sure, we might have got a few of the details a little off here and there, but that's the fun part of history. <laughs> Things get changed a little bit. I just found out the Count of Monte Cristo is a real story. Are you serious? I'm not even kidding. It's an actual tale of uh, a guy who was screwed out of his business by his best friend who wanted his wife and ended up going to jail for seven years and getting out and vowing revenge, taking the inheritance that he got. And uh, killing off all the accomplices to his, you know, being thrown in jail. And then to his best friend, who had now married his wife. And on his way to go meet his wife, he was killed by one of his best friend's, you know, like, compatriots. And it's a horrible tale. It's, like, horrible. But that got passed down to Dumas, who turned it into uh, Count a of Monte classic. Cristo. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Exactly. So that's why I love real history. Because so often does it get turned into great literature or just they're great stories. What attracted you to steampunk, the genre, specifically? Uh, I love the idea of twisting that happens so much in steampunk. So steampunk is about taking something that didn't exist, 
twisting it till it did exist or taking the idea of like a juxtaposition of something. Um, I love to bring up Scott Westerfeld's uh, book because he did it beautifully with the sense of biological technology and then mechanical technology that Which book clash. Is uh, it's Leviathan. Leviathan. Great book. Yeah. It's a great steampunk work. Um, but then also for me, it was kind of wanting to write in the Victorian era and wanting to write, Truly, Iron Horseman comes out of a simple desire to have airships firing at each other, like broadside, you know, uh, just like ships on the sea. That was literally where Iron Horseman came out of. So I went with that notion, and everything else came out of that. Iron Horseman's been published. Um, what have been some of the? What were some of the obstacles you faced leading up to that? <laughs> Iron Horseman's a funny story, actually. It got, uh, so it originally, I wrote it uh, a couple years ago, so around 2011, 2012, somewhere around there, and wrote it, sent it off to an agent, an agent kind of liked it, and met her at a conference, uh, but she didn't like that it was a, a YA, so we turned it into a middle grade. We spent six months converting it into a middle grade. Um, and it didn't work because it's a, it's a tale of a 16 year old kid who's finding himself and becoming a man. So <laughs> that didn't really work when you transpose that down <laughs> to a younger age. Mm -hmm. Um, but it ended up being, you know, that wasn't the right book to turn into a middle grade. I've since written a steampunk middle grade that I'm currently chopping. So, um, that worked out way much better as a middle grade. So, um, but we worked for six months on that and then she passed on it. So, it, you know, that was, like, soul-crushing and hard to deal with. And then I went through and I revamped the entire book and rewrote it. Um, and then when uh, Treehouse came along, they were interested. And with Blank Slate, we were doing it. So um, it kind of became this thing. And I pitched all the books that I had to them, and that was the one they loved the most. So it was kind of like, nice, let's go with that. How did you overcome those things it sounds like there were there was a long process and then at the end there was disappointment for a while how did you get through that part that i wrote period? other books uh, <laughs> <laughs> no to be perfectly honest uh, I, I i did write other books so i moved on and i kept writing um which allowed me to focus my energies elsewhere for a bit and then come back to iron horseman um and it's it's a good tale i really like it um so I was able to kind of keep coming back to it and improving it and making it better to the point where, you know, when I was laying out the few ideas for books that I was really interested in publishing and pitching to uh, Treehouse, that that was the book that really interested them the most. Have there been any, have there been any obstacles you faced to do with being published and having a contract as a writer? Tons. Um, you know, I'm not going to go into all the craziness that happened with, uh, Iron Horseman, but it did get pushed back. So it had an original date and got pushed back about three weeks and that led to all kinds of craziness. Um, you know, so there, there's little things like that along the way. Um, you know, I, I've run into all kinds of fun little nick things as you move forward. Like, uh, it didn't qualify for some contest because it came out too late in the year. It didn't qualify for certain things because of the way that it's written, structured, and everything like that. So, you know, there was odd things, but every book has that. So I, I think that a lot of it, you know, that you're going to run into is going to be any book you run into. I was greatly disappointed uh, the week that it came out. Oh. We sold a ton of copies at Main Street. We were super excited. And then myself, neither myself or Sarah Bromley made the best-selling in St. Louis list. Hmm. Uh, because it was holidays, and, you know, everyone was buying Goodnight St. Louis and all these other really amazing books. Had it been any other week of the year, though, we would have probably been number one and number two on the best-selling in St. Louis week. So it's, it's fun little things like that. Uh, you know, is that does that mean my book's bad or anything? No, but... It's just one of those little things. It was the holidays. You know, oh well, live and learn. <laughs> Try better next time. Family. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, I'll have to hold a book signing in, like, I don't know, February or something when no books are coming out. And then I'll be ruling the list. Yay. Now you know something that you didn't know before. But I think before. every book has little hiccups, little steps that, you know, two of them that, you know, happen. I think it's something all writers just need to deal with. Uh, you know, as a publisher, you know, for last year now, I've put out a bunch of books and... You know, I 
I equate it to musical theater, and anyone who's been in the theater knows this, that theater is chaos until the actual curtain goes up on opening night. And then there's this weird magical thing that happens where it all smooths out and everyone loves it and you get great reviews. But the night before is the <laughs> craziest night in the possibility existence of the theater. So, you know, having come out of that world, I kind of understand that books are going to have this chaos around them. And then that'll all smooth out into this nice, beautiful launch. And people will love it and read it. And they'll be reading it for the next few years and talking about it and all that kind of fun stuff. So I truly believe that about all books. How has your time... Um working in the publishing industry and working with St. Louis Writers Guild as a president affected you as a writer? Hugely. Um, I am leaps and bounds better than I was when I stepped into uh, St. Louis Writers Guild uh, many, many moons ago. Um, you know, it's, a, it's just like so many people do, actually. I, I had a book I'd written. It was 200,000 words long, um, which for those of you who are not familiar with that's really long um it's at least two novels exactly yeah. it was two books got trimmed down to 125 hmm. basically. wow um but anyway obviously there was a lot out there that didn't need to be there but the point is is that staying in or, you know hanging out in st louis writers guild really kind of gave me the groundwork and let me figure out how to be a writer and what this industry is and then moving forward from that and going into publishing really taught me the other side of that. Um, there are m multiple sides to this industry, and we don't always see them. Uh, as writers, we see the side that we're on. Where we write the book. Um, we see the side where we're promoting the book and pushing the book, and we go to bookstores and all that kind of stuff. But we don't see the publishing side. And there's a lot on that back side. There's a lot of craziness that goes on behind the scenes that authors just do not know about and I don't think want to know about, <laughs> um, to be perfectly honest. But it's a fascinating industry, um, the way in which it works, the fact that books do take a year to come out. Um, and really, they do. Uh, they need that time to work through the system of, you know, pre-orders and people who are looking at it and the, the arcs and that go out and... You know, the blurbs you have to get and the, you know, the placement and getting it in front of buyers and all that kind of fun stuff. I mean, it really does take this long period of time. So that was kind of a fascinating thing to learn. But through all of it, I've seen now, gosh, through St. Louis Writers Guild, we have hundreds of members uh, through the years that I've been there. I mean, we do at least 20-something workshops a year. So, you know, in terms of that, it's a huge, just vast knowledge level that I've been able to, you know, to absorb by being at each and every one of these meetings. <laughs> so, you know, even though I'm sitting there in the back and making sure it all runs smoothly, I'm still listening to that speaker every time. So I've just gained a lot of knowledge that way. And then being on the other side as a publisher, getting to read all of these amazing submissions that came in. Some of them may not be as amazing as others, but that teaches you. Um, it not only teaches you what people are looking for, but it also teaches you, you know, how to craft your own work. You can see what works, what doesn't work, what, you know, and it's not about taking anyone's ideas and putting it into your own work, because that would be a horrible idea. But it's about understanding what makes a good book and understanding what makes a book people want to read. And, and that knowledge, I think, is invaluable. I think that that does make your perspective a unique one, but very strategically placed to be able to help younger writers and writers period um so coming from all these backgrounds the writing background the publishing background the uh writing community background and then theater as well what advice would you have for writers who are maybe wanting to start out or deciding if they want to continue um well that's a very good question actually. and also wanting to get into publishing or not sure if that's for them well, uh, it's, you know, uh, it's, I, the number one thing I would tell anyone is to not give up. And the reason I say that is because this business, no matter which side you go into, um, they, it's a roller coaster. It, every f side of our industry has its ups and downs. And if you only live for the ups, you're constantly going to be chasing something that is intangible. Um, and if you 
are always, you know, put out by the downs to the point where you're going to leave, you'll never go anywhere in this business because this business doesn't have a solid, straight, flat line. <laughs> um, you know, you'll have your ups and your peaks, and those will be followed by huge downs, and those downs will then, you know, come up more. Um, you know, everyone is chasing the next book. Mm-hmm. Everyone's also criticizing the last book. You know, so there's this, there's, there's always this up and down in this industry. Um, for those wanting to get into writing, start writing. Um, put pen on paper. Type, typing it down. It doesn't matter if anyone else sees it, reads it, or anything else. That that's that comes later. Um, the important thing is to actually write um, and write, you know, as much as possible. And trust me, you'll get better at it. Uh, if you want to get into publishing, um, there's a lot of ways to do that. I'd actually recommend not going the way I did. It's a very impractical way. Um, start off at school and go to college for it. If you want to be an agent. Um, if you want to be in one of the big publishing houses, guess what? They have interns every year. They are seeking interns. Uh, go be a, be an intern in one of the houses. Um, you know, at, at Blank Slate Press, we had five of them uh, mm. last year, um, and all of them are probably going to go on to do much you know bigger things in publishing than I will. But uh, it's very cool, and y- there is that path. Um, but we have options. So if you want, you can start your own house. It's entirely possible to do. Um, and, you know, start small and work your way up. Don't expect to be one of the big boys and, you know, sell Divergent in your first year. That may or may not happen. Good luck if it does. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the point is, is that in this business, you really need to, uh, I'll take this back in a second, but you need to start small and work your way up to the big leagues. Uh, when I say that is, is a, as you're starting your own press, focus it, you know, figure out what your brand is, figure out what you're publishing, who your readers are, you know, and go from there and build off that. Now, if you're a writer, I have kind of the opposite. Start at the top and work your way down. <laughs> uh, if you're a writer, start up at the big houses, start up with the big agents, start in New York, always start in New York. And the reason I say that is, you never know. You might be the next Divergent type, you know, uh, Twilight or, you know, Harry Potter. And if you are, that's where you want to be and those are the people you're going to say. But if they say, you know, no on that book, that is hardly the last stop. Uh, you've got, you know, smaller presses below that. You've got even smaller presses below that. And then at the very bottom, you've got your own ability to self-publish. So there's so many options that... First, I would really recommend getting informed and then moving on from there. That's really good advice. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> this has been Brad R. Cook from Right Back Radio. I hope you all enjoyed getting to know him. Bye. Hello, this is Kathleen Kayembe and David Allen Lucas. And we are interviewing Melanie Colaney today. So you can learn more about our Right Pack Radio speakers. Melanie, hi. Hi. I would like to start off by asking you who you are. Who is Melanie Colaney? I hate that question, and I think everyone that you've asked that hates that question. But, uh, <laughs> oh well, um, better on. answer it to get rid of it then. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, from a writing point of view, um, not sure. I'd say at this point in my life, my primary identity probably isn't as a writer. Unlike a lot of people I know, uh, I actually like my day job. Mm-hmm. But um, so I guess I think of myself as a scientist or a researcher, and uh, I uh, let's see. <laughs> I guess I let's see. Who am I? What do you research? Because it's funny to me that you've mentioned your primary identity being with your job as a scientist and a researcher. So. What do you do there? Well, I I work in the program of physical therapy, and just to keep my two sides of my life separate, I'm not going to mention which, but if anyone really cares, they can find out by Googling, so it's not that big of a secret. But um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm not a physical therapist, but I do movement, re- I, I work in a research lab doing movement research, and I do not, I have a master's degree, not a PhD. That's really cool. So it means that uh, someone else is responsible for funding 
and I actually do a whole lot of the research. Does that mean you could tell me six ways to kill a person with just their, their physical body features, muscles, and all that? Afraid not. Dave would be oh. much better with that. I'm at our lab uh, is lo researching mostly the lower body, so you know I'm I'm researching uh, things to do with like movement, uh, uh, osteoarthritis, that type of thing. Um, Does that feed into your writing? It the same interests that got me into this also feed into my writing, and it certainly feeds into the way I think about my writing. But at the moment, none of my writing projects have to do with physical therapy or with uh, you, with the, the types of research I'm doing. So <laughs> but, now that you've mentioned your writing projects, I would like to ask, what sort of genres do you write in? What kind of projects are they? Okay, well, my first love is probably, well, is <laughs> hardcore science fiction. Um, right now, uh, I am writing urban fantasy and I am doing that because I want to write something that to basically improve my writing skills and to work on developing characters and character interaction and I think my sci-fi novel I care about too much that's what I both well my sci-fi novel in some form or another little bitty pieces of it probably started when I was in junior high if not high school and it's changed a lot and developed and so it's been with you a long time. Yeah, and it's been developing, and I think I came to the point after getting done with the first draft, and of course, all first drafts are awful. They're supposed to be. Yes. Their and job. I, I know this, but it's like, to do it justice, I need to improve some things. So instead of having that be my first novel that goes into your drawer never seen again, I'm writing this fantasy novel, which I'm thinking of as my drawer novel, as in... I don't care if this novel ever gets published, although I might change my mind on that. That sounds but, like a really mature perspective for, for a writer as far as the writing journey, to realize I'm not good enough yet in certain areas to write this thing that I really want to write, so then going to work on those skills in other areas. So what made you switch from high sci um, hard sci-fi to urban fantasy for your kind of uh, skill testing and skill... Yeah. Uh, improving well, novel. My favorite part of writing is world building. Which it really is my favorite. I don't seem to be able to write unless it's a well developed world. And um, one of my problems with my sci fi novel is that I was spending all my time world building and not enough time writing. So I wanted a writing project where I could still do some world building because mm -hmm. that's just what I like to do, but it wouldn't take so long. So this fantasy novel is set in an alternate version of St. Louis, and I've told myself I'm only allowed to research things as they come up for the story. So, basically, everything's like the real world unless I have a specific reason why they shouldn't be that way. It sounds like your researcher, um, your researching experience comes into play in your writing in this way. It definitely does. Um, in both fantasy and sci-fi, I think we've talked about this on Right Pack Radio some. You have a contract with your reader, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and anything could go, but you have to maintain, you have to follow the contract you've set up with the reader. Mm -hmm. You have to re set up the reader expectations. And I really get annoyed when I read a book and the world is internally inconsistent. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if there's magic. If there's magic in the world, there's magic in the world. But the world has rules, and every universe needs to follow its own rules. Hmm. And um, if it seems to violate them, it needs to violate them because the rules weren't really what we thought they were. Ah. So this is true for fantasy and it's true for sci-fi. The only thing different is your, pr your, your laws are different. So, so that sounds like some good world-building advice, actually, that... You need to keep the internal rules of your world consistent, whether or not it's fantasy, sci-fi, or even our world now. You can't just yeah. break certain things. Well, and for this sci-fi novel, I um, I basically made a major division. Basically, magic really exists. That's the first one. Mm -hmm. But the second, I changed one or two major things about how the world works, and then just in my head try and think through logically what that would lead to. And hmm. that was my world. So, um... That sounds like 
your science background again coming yeah. into play, taking a premise and then uh, following it to its logical conclusions. Yeah, and um, actually that is, that's very much in research, if you, you try and think through an experiment before you do it, if you do set whatever it is, what do you expect will happen? And it doesn't mean that you're right, it just means that you have a reasonable guess before you go further. Mm -hmm. So a question that I've asked um, some other people today has been about publication. Have you been published? Are you looking to be published? Well, yes and no. My fiction writing, right now, I'm not trying. I, my goal is to get a novel completely done before I start worrying about it. That's a good plan. And I know that, you know, you have to market and all that. I don't know, a good year in advance at least of when things come out. Mm -hmm. But right now, again, this is my drawer novel. So by definition, I don't care about get, getting published. But um, I have tried to get, in addition to other people, scientific papers published. And... Um, Getting journal articles published is very different. Oh, are um, there any lessons that you've learned from that that you think will apply to writing? Um, the fiction writing, that is? I should, I yeah, should specify that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, naturally, yes, I have been published in the scribe. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, some of it does apply to uh, writing in, um, Nonfiction writing, as in if you were writing for a magazine or a journal. For writing m novels, I don't think so. But for, uh, so, um, for instance, knowing your audience mm -hmm. and writing to your audience, um, a general rule of thumb that I've heard in writing is always write for the level below you think you're writing for. Hmm. So in science, for instance, um, if you're writing a technical paper, let's say you're writing a paper that you think should be published in Nature Genetics. Mm -hmm. Well, write it like you were writing for nat regular nature. Mm -hmm. If you want your paper published in nature, oh, and for those of you that are not familiar with science, nature is a huge scientific journal. It is a really big deal. Okay, but point is, if you're trying to write it for nature, r write with the thing in mind that you're really writing it for Scientific America. Okay. If you're trying to write an article so, for Scientific America, go for Time Magazine. So basically, wow. write in a slightly more accessible way than you think that the audience you're going for Right, will but the understand. thing is, that's not what happens. That's what you think you're doing. Hmm. It le when you're an expert in the field, you, you think, think more complicated. an expert. You think more complicated than everyone else. So, thing so almost it's expectation managing again. In order hmm. to get it to the right level, you think you're doing one level below that. I see. That's really cool. Yeah. Did you have a question? No, just real. I would, <clears throat> just real quick clarification for our listeners. The scribe, which is some, which Melanie described, is a easing that's put out by St. Louis Writers Guild. Yeah, and I actually have to write an article for that. So, uh, mm -hmm. so yes, I am getting published in that. But again, things that oh, and both scientific articles that I'm trying to get published in mm -hmm. and the scribe. No, they don't pay you for those. <laughs> I had a question actually about another genre that. I have heard you mention in Right Pack Radio episodes, but that you haven't mentioned here. It was the cookbook. Oh, yeah. I'm not working... And what? And poetry? Oh, no. Not not me. That okay. wasn't me. But um, the cookbook, I do have a cookbook that I haven't worked on in a while, so I didn't even think to bring it up. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I have probably... I, my recipe file is online. So when I get... And if I ever find the time to write out the directions for writing all out all those recipes, it'll probably be ready. But good news is there's a whole lot of other good cookbooks there. So even if it gets done, I'm not sure how much of a market there'd be. Speaking of good cookbooks, who are some of your literary heroes? Who are some of the people that you read and the the books that you enjoy reading, be they cookbooks or fiction or nonfiction? Okay. Um, at the moment, I am... I what I do a lot is the St. Louis Library, both city library and county library, have downloadable audiobooks. Oh, on so, Overdrive. On Overdrive, and that's an app. Yes, so I download those and listen to them while I'm doing other stuff. So part of what I listen to is predicated on what's available. Now I will mm -hmm. go and seek out stuff that if it isn't available. So it really changes. A book I just found. Um, and it's urban fantasy, so, uh, 
It is D.D. Barrant, which uh, B-A-R-A-N-T, and that's a non de plume of another writer, and I don't remember the writer's real name, mm -hmm. but uh, that's actually an FBI profiler that gets pulled into an alternate universe where about half the population is vampires, uh, about 40% of the population is were, were animals, and about 10% of the population is golems, and Ooh. less than 1% of the population is regular humans. Wait, hold on. Don't put your phone away. Um, that was the pause, actually. She was checking her phone to see what it was. Please send me that, that title. Okay. Please. It, the name of the book, uh, the first book in the series, is Dying Bites, and it's by D. Period, D. Period, Barrett, B-A-R-A-N-T. Um... I also listen to slash read, and I actually have read his books, uh, Jim Butcher. Oh, Dresden Files. Yes, uh, I haven't actually, I'm not cut up in the Dresden Files. He has another series that I don't know if it's finished or if he's staying on. It's... Um, Academy's Fury is yes, one of them? Yes, Academy's Fury oh. is the second book of the series. For Furies of Cauldron is the first one. And that is uh, Lost Roman Legion meets Pokemon. That's really what it is. Roman Legion, I choose you. Yes. yes. And it's a very good series, and I think it's ended in a good spot if he doesn't want to write any more books in it. But, um, <laughs> and, uh, again, I've, I haven't read her most recent book, but I've read Charlene Harris, and I've read, uh, both her books that, her Suki Stackhouse books, but I've also read her other series. She has another series? She has mm -hmm. two other series. There, uh, the first series is definitely a cozy, Murder mm -hmm. Mystery Cozy. Uh, that's the Aurora Tea Garden series, and then she has a bunch of books that Shakespeare is in the title. Shakespeare's Landlord. It's probably not the first book in the series, but that's one of them. I'm intrigued by that title just by itself. Yeah, but Charlene Harris and Stucky Stackhouse, I thought that was uh, it's a very good model for me because, again, she's writing an urban fantasy, and her books are sort of like set in the real world, except magic is real. Mm -hmm. One of the things that always bugged me about Jim Butcher and uh, the, the Dresden Files mm -hmm. With everything that happens in that book, how can the regular world, the mundane people, not know magic exists? So That sounds like a pet peeve. It is a pet peeve of mine. So in my fantasy, again, the amount of magic in the world is roughly the same as in Dresden Files. But guess what? Everybody knows magic exists. Everyone has to deal with magic existing. They might try and deny it, but magic exists. They... The human world is dealing with it. They might be dealing with it badly, but they can't deny it. It sounds like that's an internal consistency, another world-building point. Yes. That, and that makes sense to me that it would be so upsetting in that case. Yeah, and the other, uh, speaking of consistency, I have to, one of the things I haven't quite worked out yet, because I promised myself I'm not going to do it till it comes up, I have some of the basic ways magic works in my world, but the little details, for instance, I've decided I definitely have shapeshifters in my book, mm -hmm. but do shapeshifters have to maintain the same mass? Hmm. You know, these are things that you don't really think about, but they have all these implications. So if they have to maintain the same mass, for instance, if a person changes into a bird, that bird's either going to be huge or not going to be able to fly. That seems like your hard science background is coming into play here, too. Yep, and it's fantasy, again, but the difference in it is that the differences are in the laws of the universe, but how they're applied, it's the same. You have to apply the laws, whatever they are. So I so. think we should close this with what advice you have for other writers. Um, well, for someone just getting started, um, try... I, Mark Twain, I think, was credited with saying, write with you know. Mm-hmm. Someone else, that I don't remember who the someone else was, was write what you like to read. Mm -hmm. Definitely agree. Um, and uh, taking, as long as you don't take them too seriously, taking writing classes actually are good. I was amazed. My mom was actually, you know, had adult children before she realized they were classes that helped teach you how to write fiction. She thought you just had to write. What would you so. say to other scientists who would like to write fiction but maybe don't think it's of the same caliber or um, importance as their scientific work? Well, I think you'd be surprised on how few scientists actually 
think that way. They might be more focused on careers mm -hmm. than that, but, um, oh, I need to look this up so I don't propose an urban legend that's not quite true, but okay. the guy that's credited with inventing PCR, which as non-scientists you might not know what it is, but no, I don't. DNA testing, mm -hmm. well, PCR is just something that makes that possible. That's not DNA testing itself, but mm -hmm. it's it's a process by which DNA is replicated, so you okay. can have one strand of DNA, then you can have a lot of DNA. But um, point is, I believe he got the Nobel for that, but that comes with a cash prize. Mm -hmm. I believe that scientist used that cash prize to take some time off to write uh, fiction. Oh, wow. I think. Again, this is something, a story I heard in college. Please, please, please don't requote me without looking it up for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fact check. Do, do something that the news agencies don't do. Fact check. Yes. Oh, that actually, that would be my another thing. Even if you're writing fiction, please fact check. Your work will be better for it. I think that is definitely good advice. And on that note, thank you, Melanie. Um, this has been another member of Right Pack Radio that we've interviewed, Melanie Kalani. Hello, this is Kathleen Kayembe with Right Pack Radio. And this is David Allen Lucas here to here to interview Matt McGraw. Hello. We love him. He drives us up a wall by calling himself an amateur writer. Not paid yet. So, who are you, amateur writer? What do you write, amateurishly? Oh no, you went on ahead and did that question. Yes, okay. I did. You're yeah. welcome for that. Uh, well, let's see. I was thinking about it on the way here. It's not a question I'm personally interested in, you know? Because mm -hmm. people, they have their own image of you. And uh, no matter what you think it should be or what you'd like it to be, they're just going to have it. You know, so you, it's one of those things you should just leave aside. It's out of your control. Just put it away. But who is the writer, Matt McGraw, in your <laughs> eyes? Oh, well, I'm also not... I try to keep it out of writing as well. I feel like ego's ego's kind of a problem when you're writing, isn't it? You know, your writer should be more like a god. Should have like a godly perspective. You know, explain if, that. Well, like a human, a human has a small perspective. We mm -hmm. see like limited things. We perceive limited stuff. We have our own particular history and background that we have. And you know, like it's hard to. It makes it more difficult to put yourself in other people's shoes, see how they see things, how they experience the world. But if you're a writer, you know, you want to build, like, worlds with multiple people in them. You need to be able, be able to write different kinds of characters, so it's better if you have a broader perspective. So what? you need to step outside your ego in order to write. What sorts of things do you write? Uh, it ends up being mostly, like, fantasy, sci-fi kind of things, if we're going to go for a genre perspective. Uh, I like writing interiors of people, I guess, is how I would put it. Interiors of people? Like character sketches? Yeah, kind of. Um, I guess that's the general character of it. As I like, I like stepping, trying to put myself into another person's shoes and just experiencing the world completely from them. Oh, okay. And that's how I like to write, too. Uh, I think of it as being, like, cinematic, I want to say, where I don't, like... I think part of the strength of writing is that uh, you can be, like, inside a character's head and you can hear their thoughts and all that, as opposed to other mediums where you can't necessarily. Mm. I like to ignore that strength completely <laughs> and, uh, you know, just pretend that I'm kind of, like, shooting a movie and just pretend... present the things as they are. That sounds like the God perspective, again... Not necessarily being inside of the character, but getting, seeing what everything is, what's going on. Yeah, I like that interplay between what a person thinks they are, how they think about things, and how things actually are. Is that why when we asked you, who is Matt McGraw the writer, you uh, spun some stuff out? A little mm, bit? I don't know, maybe. That's a little too introspective for me. <laughs> I would never think that hard about it. But one of the things you seem to like about being a writer is getting into other people's heads, getting into characters' heads. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's like taking a walk. If you're stuck in, like, I don't know, if you were in jail. Let's say you were in jail. You orange is the new black, all right. You live in a prison cell with other ladies in orange. Stylish. Who are sometimes after you. 
less stylish. And, you know, you get like your hour a day to go take a walk outside. Mm -hmm. That's what the writing is. It's an hour a day to go take a walk outside your own skull. I mean, I think even write, or I mean, readers have that same sort of experience with it. So, you know, they've got their life and they understand all those bits of it. They're seeing every part of that. But then you can open a book or, you know, do some other thing and kind of go somewhere else. You know, take a walk outside yourself for a little bit. Um, what are some of the troubles you've run into as a writer? Uh, dialogue's always a big problem, I find. It's, uh, it's hard to get outside. It's the hardest, I think, to get outside your own way of speaking. Mm -hmm. Just how you, uh, how you orient ideas, how you explain them, your vocabulary even. You know, there's a lot of, like, different words that people pick depending on where they were born, uh, what kind of class, social class they came up in. You know, tons of other things like that, even just what friends they had. You know, like an in-joke in high school might become a lifelong vocabulary quirk. Hmm. That's, again, about getting into characters' heads. You seem to like that very much. Do you do that in your daily life, too? Or is it something that you keep to writing and reading entertainment? You mean, like, do I look at people and imagine, like, what their lives are from the inside? Yeah, do you do you analyze people? Uh, yeah, I guess, I guess so. I never really thought about it that way. But I do like, I like looking at people and, like, reading what I prefer are, like, uh, kind of objective signs mm -hmm. of, like, uh, just, like, little clues, almost, like being a detective. Hmm kind of figure out like where their perspective is like how they how they approach things what their priorities and values are that's the most important thing i think is what's because like a lot of questions of should i do this should i do that really come down to which do you value more this thing or that thing and so that that question is where like individuality comes in is it more important to get this thing or that thing is more important to get the girl or get revenge maybe Something like that. That's the kind of person you are, which one you pick. When you have both, or when you can't have both, and you need to pick one. So you like to play with the moral choices that the person can make, be, be it small or large. Uh, yeah, moral choices are, you know, a part of life. They come mm -hmm. up every day. Even when you're, like, walking through a door and you're, like, you see somebody coming, they're, like, ten feet away, maybe, you know? You could hold the door for them. And if you let it close, <clears throat> it's going to close directly in their face, pretty much. Mm. But, you know, which is more important? Get you getting on your way a little bit sooner or being a little nice to some other person? Who are some of the writers and what are some of the stories that you've read that have done this well? Or influenced mm. your view of it. Yeah. Writers who have done it well. Ah. Uh. You can also add films. I think it's fine. Uh, well, let's see. I'm not... I don't know if this counts, really. Uh, one guy I can think of is uh, Nicholas Winding Refn. He, re he directed Drive. Uh, mm -hmm. He also directed Only God Forgives, which I rather liked. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that counts, though, because he has like a specific kind of character that he enjoys exploring. I think it's a little too close to himself, probably. Mm-hmm. But uh, he kind of just gets into that, gets into the person's head and just explores it directly from there, which I enjoy. Uh, let's see. I guess, like, a good, like, kind of, like, mainstream example would be, like, uh, George R. R. Martin, you know? Mm -hmm. He does the specific character chapters. That's one of the things he talks about in interviews, is that he tries to experience things from the perspective of that character. And, you know, it's one of those things people ask him about, like, you know, do you take any joy in killing off all those characters that we like? He's like, no, you know, I like them all. I try to get into their heads and see them as fully realized people, even the ones that aren't particularly uh, savory in any way. Like uh, Cersei is always a good example. She ends up, uh, some terrible things happen to her eventually. But, you know, his perspective, I think, is I still have to like her. I still have to see her perspective and kind of see things from her end in order to write her effectively. Does that get hard for you as a writer, to be able to do that with characters that don't seem outwardly very sympathetic? Uh, yeah, a little bit. It's hard to, like, especially when it comes to moral choices, especially, like, ones that are far away from you. 
mm-hmm. you know, that would be like the exact opposite of what you think is important, what you think is really important. And to kind of come at that character in an even-handed way to see things from their perspective. How would you advise writers, what do you use to be able to do that? And what do you think would be helpful to other writers if, when they're trying to do the same thing? Mm, leave yourself behind. You have to... I think what helps most is having a little less respect for yourself and your own perspective. Mm-hmm. And just kind of putting it aside for a moment, saying, okay, that's great and all, but I need to leave it behind for a little bit. Mm-hmm. I'm going to pretend to be this other person. Approach it like uh, acting, I guess. Hmm. Like, uh, you know, that's basically what an actor does. If you uh, you read the lines, you get a sense of what the person is, depending on what choices they make, what they say, where they come from, all that. And you sort of build that person in your brain. And then when you need to go on stage... That's what you do. You set yourself behind, and then you just go out as that person. Literally. Ideally. Getting into character. Mm-hmm. So, um, I think we should close with advice you would have for writers who are amateur, mm-hmm. who love writing, or who think they would love writing, but have not actually gone about doing it. What would you say to them? How would you, would you tell them to get into it, and how do they stick with it? Well, there's a, light, there's a lot of guides out there about how to, you know, make it professionally, how to do the publishing and all that. But I'd say while you're doing all that stuff, just keep at writing. Uh, there's, no, there's no replacement for the actual work of sitting down and just doing it. And even if you don't do anything else, well, and here's another aspect in which keeping your ego out of it is good. Mm-hmm. Uh, never stop trying to improve. That's uh, the other big fault you can run into, I think, is uh, if you just get comfortable smelling your own farts. And uh, you, can't, you can't stay there. You'll never grow. You'll never get more skillful. And uh, theoretically, your career will never go anywhere if you're worried about that. But, uh, yeah, um, you always have to be striving to improve. Build your vocabulary. Build your cast of characters. Understand other people better. Uh, learn more different perspectives out there, and uh, you know, just learn more, I guess. it's uh, Writing comes hand-in-hand hand with reading. Reading is learning. Even if you're reading, uh, I don't know, whatever kind of book, even like a mainstream one, you're learning things. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> or if you're reading like philosophy or fiction or anything, even a fiction story is somebody's perspective that came from somebody's mind. And it contains ideas that they think are true, even if it's fictionalized. That seems like very good advice. Thank you for your time, Matt. Uh, n- no problem. <laughs> I have plenty of it. Uh, it's okay. All right, cool. Everybody, this is Matt McGraw, member of Right Pack Radio. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye now. Next week on Right Pack Radio, we will have interviews with Jennifer Stolzer, Meredith Tate, and David Allen Lucas. Tune in, won't you? For the season finale of Season 1 of Right Pack Radio. The Right Pack would like to thank STL Books for allowing us to record in their bookstore. STL Books and Gifts is St. Louis's newest independent bookstore with an emphasis on fine literature for adults and children and the most comprehensive selection of St. Louis books available anywhere. Visit them online at stlbooks.com or in person at 100 West Jefferson Avenue, Kirkwood, Missouri, 63122. Tune in next week as the Right Pack will conquer yet another pondering issue in the writing industry. Theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.